It's that time of the day again. Yes, I'm pleased to say it is Talking Pints. Paul McGowan joins me. Paul, welcome. Cheers, to Nigel. Good to the see you again. Program. Now, I'm always keen to know on Talking Pints about people's journeys, how they go from one place to another. There you are. You're growing up in Thanet in East Kent. School, you don't particularly excel at. No, not at all. Not, not at, at all. all. Constant runaway. Uh, yeah, you didn't sort of quite make no. the course in school. No. Fine, not everyone does. And then you decide, it's the parachute regiment for me. And somehow you go from being in the parachute regiment to deciding you want to be an artist. And I suspect there aren't that many paras who become artists. I, I tell me I'm wrong. What <laughs> happened? How? Well, the funny thing is, um, when I left the army, I had no idea what I was going to do. No idea. Um, and one of my friends said to me, Paul, why don't you come work, work with us up in fashion in London? So I said, OK, then, no problem. It's a job. Good. So I went up there and um, I sort of enjoyed it. But after about five years, I thought I didn't want to end up an older person in fashion with a long ponytail, which they all seem to have. And I weren't prepared to do that. So I thought, well, I always wanted an education. So let's go to university. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Did you? So despite the fact that you not made the most of it in your teens? No, I, I literally lost a plot when I was younger. And, but the army helped me get back on track and work in, in London, because I used to commute every day from Margate all the way to London, work that's and commute all and the way back. before HS1. Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah, It was a long journey. It was a long journey, but the trouble is, if you worked in Margate, you couldn't make any money. If you worked in London and worked, spent that extra five hours a day commuting, you could earn good yeah. money, you know? Yeah. So that was definitely what I was going to do. So... But got to one point, I thought, what am I going to do in my life? I don't want to stay in fashion. What am I going to do? Yeah. So I went to university. I went to Falmouth. Um, I was really lucky. I got picked up when I was at Falmouth by um, an art dealer. And I, w I worked through university. I went through Falmouth, then Loughborough, then Winchester, and then Bath Spa. So I was a student and a professional artist at the same time. So it's really weird. But I had no financial problems as a student because of it. So it was, um, it was really lucky, really. And why art? I think I always wanted to do it um, from a child. But it's one of those things that you don't think, well, I'm not going to go for that. It's, what's the odds of never being able to make it as a professional artist? And it just seemed to click. Well, I think it gave me so much confidence when I got picked up by a gallery really early. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, well, anything's possible. So we, we went from strength to strength. And, it and you were able to earn a living fairly quickly? Um, no, <laughs> no. I it's not no. easy, it is took, it? it took a long time. Um, probably, I was well into my 30s before I could make a living out of making art. And um, I, I absolutely loved doing it because I could be as controversial as I wanted on paper. Mm. And back then, I had no platform, I had no voice, and you had your website, you, there was no social media. And then, um, as social media came out, I, I ended up more and more political and speaking out. And more yeah, and more well, we're going to come to that, but first... You got picked up by the Eden Project, yeah. which was a massive project down in Cornwall, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and actually, still to this day, it, you know, is a very, very big tourist site and a very attractive place. And you kind of got involved in that because you are an environmentalist, yeah? Yeah, I'm an environmentalist, a lifelong one. I will always be an environmentalist, but I do not believe in CO2 climate change. Oh, that must make you a rare beast, because well, nearly all environmentalists today... Because I feel... I, I'm in a similar camp to you. You know, I'm an environmentalist, but I'm, I'm, I'm questioning. Yeah, I'm, I've always questioned it. I don't believe in anything when they say the science is settled. If they, as soon as they say the science is settled, science is never settled. If the Victorians said that, we'd Ooh. still be going around in steam trains. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really important to, you know, to analyse these things. And there's so much money going into the climate industry. <laughs> it's, I think, no, what you the, never said. Yeah, what the <laughs> hell, where is all that money going? Billions, you billions. Know? Yeah, billions, billions, billions. But the Eden Project, your art kind of fitting into this this theme of a lot of animals, a lot of species living on the edge. Yeah, yeah, that's correct, that's correct. That's correct. So I, I loved my time there, but I was not the only person that did not believe in CO2 climate okay. change there. Lots of people back then in, in the climate industry, well, it was environmentalism back then, loads of people didn't believe in it. And over the years, they've been weaned out of the industry. So people have worked in there for years, like look at David Bellamy, for yeah, example. I remember pushed out the door, pushed yeah. out the door. And the BBC treated him terribly, absolutely well, terribly. In the end, the politics kind of takes over quite a bit, doesn't it? And we finish up in 2010 with a, a 
a pretty dramatic incident that you're involved in. It is oh, yeah. your art is being yeah. displayed, and it is a pretty controversial piece of art, isn't it? Yeah, it was. It was made to be controversial. Um, what were you trying to say in that picture? I was just trying to. Well, you got you got to you got to remember that explosive devices were really there was a lot in the news about them at the time. And if you're an artist, you cannot ignore what's actually going on. You're, you're, I'm a social documenter, so you, I document what's going on. So the whole bomb on the stepladder, I called it bad ladder. It was a bit tongue and cheek, really, and it wasn't so much about environmentalism. It was about the times we live in, we live in, you know, and it, I was trying to reflect the instability of our time. But what happened was, um, it had been in a window for three days, it had been in, in all over London, it had been in magazines, it had been on the cover of a book in France, it wasn't a new piece that I did. And on the day of the show, the day of the opening, it would have been great if it had happened two days before, on the day of the opening, they put two big... Um, police vans outside the gallery. They waited for a young girl to come in uh, to open up the gallery. Then they decided to jump out with machine guns, fully armed, and make a big fuss over it. It was totally un unexpected. And when the gallery rung me up, I thought they were winding me up. I didn't actually believe it. And then, then I went down to the gallery, then the BBC rung me up, because the BBC, the police informed the BBC straight away. So then the BBC gave me an interview for about 40 minutes on the phone, which they printed zero, none of it, none of it, not a single word of it. They wrote their own script. And on top of that, even later on in the afternoon, right at five o'clock, they put out a bulletin saying there was a bomb in a London gallery. And by this time, they'd already understood that that was not the case. But they put it out anyway, and it... it, it, it absolutely wrecked the show because loads of people thought it was shut down. <laughs> so, so you were censored? So it took, yeah, totally censored. Your art was censored? Yeah, always censored. But I've been censored a lot, Nigel. I mean, <laughs> I'm now banned from um, platforms like Facebook because they decided, because I make memes and I make Brexit artwork, they decided that I'm... I, I, I'm on a list of dangerous people or organisations. And now, that's Brexit what they was used a, to censor Brexit me. was a passion for you? Yeah, totally. I could never understand why we had to give Brussels so much money, then they gave us it back, our own money, then put a little EU flag on it, and then pretended they'd given it to us. And it was always the taxpayers' and, money. And, and it used to drive art, me your insane. Art, your art about the European Union doesn't depict the European Union in a particularly good light, does it? No, well, it doesn't. Would you like to see yeah, it? Yeah, no? I think you've got an example hiding well, down there, Robbie. I, I <laughs> sent quite a lot of images to the Brexit party. Yeah. And this is one of them, and you made it into a speech yeah. for the EU, and yeah. you were sitting there laughing away as it was done. So he, I've had this made up for you today. Well, thank and, you. Uh, yes, it's, it's the, uh, thank you. The, the, thank you, the, Nigel. Sort of, the sort of Death Star project. Yeah, of the, the Death European Star Union. project, but it, it worked well, we did really leave. Well. We did leave. In the end, we left. Yep. And it's three years ago today that we had the party, but maybe Brexit's not worked out quite as well as we would liked it to have done. I just don't think that the Conservatives are putting much effort into it. No, well, I, 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 I'm not sure whether they really believed in it fully. No, you know. no, no. Now, Paul, one of the most difficult things for you is you finished up, you know, as an artist, with a, with a quite serious disability with your right hand. Yeah, well, what happened was I was putting up, I think it's called an ANPR list, and it's basically where the, when you drive anywhere, mm. your number plate gets registered and, and the police swoop upon you. And I'll be honest, the majority of the police were lovely. They were absolutely fine, they were perfectly polite, but every now and then you'll bump into somebody that's not so nice. And I had already had a bad hand, I'd already had an accident, fell on it three weeks before, and they decided, I have now told him, be careful of my hand, be careful of my hand, he decided to suddenly violently, hand, violently handcuff me. And he only single locked the cuffs. So every time it moved, <coughs> it got tighter and tighter and tighter, and I just felt my whole hand just go crush down like that. So I'm in the police car, and I've got a broken hand, broken hand, broken hand. And rather amazingly, by the time we got back to the police station, all of their body cams had malfunctioned, apparently, and all the CCTV oh. outside... Out, outside the well, it's outside a fire station on a roundabout. They stopped me. It's covered with CCTV. All that malfunctions as well, and it was. Then it became a case of my word against the police's word, and because I had so many twenty-one stop and searches, including my house being searched in just over four years, loads of arrests. Because if they want to arrest you, they can just make up anything. Never any charges. Got no criminal record, and it got to the point where 
I didn't know what to do. So I wrote a letter to Labour, a letter to Liberal Democrat, Liberal, Liberal yeah. Democrats, and a letter to the Conservatives. Labour rung me up really keen, sent me a race and diversity form, which I replied, never heard from ever again. Liberal Democrats never even contacted me. And your battle is still going on, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I miss it. But Michelle Donland, she rung me up in person and she said, come up to Portcullis House and meet me and bring all your stuff. So I took it up there and I don't know what she did, but that stopped immediately. Well, that's one good thing. Yeah. But since yeah. then, you've moved on to memes and yeah. various other things, and I think you're going to go on making a nuisance of yourself. I am. I am. For totally many, many years to come, I am. you are clearly the artist they want to cancel. I, I enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Nigel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>